Thoughtseize. It's the spell of choice that's become eponymous with hand disruption. It's been at the core of many popular formats for many years now, whether in Theros Standard or in Modern, where it sees the most play. Even when Thoughtseize isn't legal in a format, the family of hand disruption spells that are legal see a lot of play. Hand disruption is one of the most annoying forms of interaction to play against, and oftentimes one of the hardest forms of interaction to master. Today, we'll be digging deep into what you need to know in order to maximize the payoff from using hand disruption spells. We'll be looking primarily at the common play patterns and tips and tricks of using Thoughtseize. We're not newbies anymore, but we're not yet ready to rival the MPL. This program is for people who already play at Friday Night Magic and enjoy playing the ladder on Arena, but want to improve and want to get better. This is for the intermediates, and this is Talarian Tutor. So what is hand disruption? At its base level, hand disruption is the act of removing resources from an opponent's hand. There are two main types of hand disruption, temporary, like Kite Sail Freebooter, or permanent like thought sees. There are also two other ways we can classify hand disruption. Hand disruption that lets you choose a resource to discard or put into exile, such as thought sees. Hand disruption that lets the opponent choose a resource to discard or put into exile, such as Mind Wrench. In all formats where there is a legal, efficient, and playable option for the former, generally speaking, we'll always pick that. With hand disruption cards like Thoughtseize, we are aiming to create a game plan by capitalizing on the disruption caused by removing a key resource. When we give that choice of what to discard to an opponent, losing the precision of a Thoughtseize, we will always get their worst card, and they will be able to avoid discarding the card that you're aiming for. While there are many decks that run hand disruption that does leave the choice to the opponent, there's a logic to why those cards are worth running. Liliana of the Veil vale and Davriel, Rogue Shadow Mage, are both played in Modern, and both force the opponent to discard cards of their choice. What makes these cards playable in Modern is that we can use their effects multiple times. On top of that, they are strong game pieces in other ways. They have other useful abilities or effects, giving them extra value. And as Planeswalkers, they provide a life total buffer, as opponents are forced to think about them as a priority. Card evaluation is key here, and when choosing what hand disruption to play, we either need to be ultra efficient and cheap, or the card has to have an impact beyond when we first play it. Kite Sail Freebooter is played in Modern Humans. It also highlights a key aspect of how to play these spells in an easy to digest form. Modern Humans is a creature damage based deck. Resolving and attacking with creatures that synergize is what wins the game. Though this card does not hit creature cards, and though the opponent will receive the card back when Kite Sail Freebooter is removed, it is still worth playing because it can represent damage. When casting a Kite Sail Freebooter then, it's often correct to take the creature removal with Kite Sail Freebooter. By taking the removal, we are using the knowledge we have gained to make a game plan based on our deck. Given what we've covered so far, we can ascertain that playing hand disruption at the most optimal level should 1. Be cheap and efficient. 2. Let us choose what to discard from our opponent. 3. Be permanent discard slash exile as opposed to temporary. 4. Allow us to formulate a game plan. It's easy to see why Thoughtseize is such a good card given these criteria. It ticks all the boxes. More than just fulfilling those criteria, Thoughtseize has become one of the most optimal and iconic plays in Modern for a reason. No matter the matchup or format, Turn 1 Thoughtseize is a meaningful play straight away that doesn't require any knowledge. Thoughtseize is also a powerful effect because of how games of Magic are played. When deciding Deciding whether to keep a starting hand, each player aims to capture a sequence of plays and options that give them the optimal strategy. To be able to pick out a key piece of this sequence can really throw an opponent off kilter. This has an even stronger effect when taking into account mulligans. If a player has had to mulligan, they will start with fewer cards in hand, at which point Thoughtseize increases in potential impact. 
Thoughtseize is also a proactive removal that can deal with issues before they arise. If your deck can't handle a particular card, Thoughtseize can remove it before it becomes an issue. Likewise, if your removal is in your sideboard, Thoughtseize can give you an out to a problem in game one before sideboarding has occurred. In understanding how to play Thoughtseize, it's useful to break this down into two main areas for study. What do I take with Thoughtseize and when to play it? The most common question Magic players learning to play Thoughtseize ask is, do I take the early play or the game ending bomb that will come down in later turns? Well, the easiest way to answer that is to emphasize that Thoughtseize isn't one size fits all. Thoughtseize takes a resource, but more than that, it takes the resource that is relevant and applicable to the format and the matchup. In making the assessment about what to take, you'll need to consider the context. What format and decks am I and my opponent playing? And how do each of us win the game? What are the most impactful plays we can make against each other? Is there a card that spells doom for me, or is the silver bullet for my opponent? Tarmogoyf strategies like Modern Jund will do whatever prolongs the game by taking away the biggest threat. They aim to poke a hole in the opposing curve to disrupt it, while enjoying the fact Thoughtseize enters their graveyard with a relevant spell type for their Tarmogoyf. This is different to how Legacy Storm decks are Thoughtseizing or using other hand disruption spells to pave the way for a combo taking a counter spell or other effect that will stop them in their tracks. Here, you'll often save your hand disruption for closer to when you want to go off, because it doesn't matter if they have a force of will turn one, you need to get rid of it prior to going off later in the game. If we're playing Jund against Azurius Control, choosing which card to take can be difficult. Most cards that the deck play are going to give them card advantage. In this scenario, taking a card at a certain converted mana cost can help to take the pressure off of you and let you resolve a threat. Slowing their second or third turn down by removing a play is better than taking a card like Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. The tempo loss from taking a turn off is worth more than them losing a card they can't yet play. To answer the other points, we need to talk about the difference between payoffs and enablers. Payoffs and enablers don't do anything intrinsically powerful on their own and are worth more together and often anemic by themselves. Nantuko Husk, for example, in Modern is played with Sacrifice Synergy. On its own, it's not too threatening, and neither are the complementary enablers. Often the simplest thought sees decisions are about payoff versus enabler. You will need to consider some other factors, such as the number of effects in a deck, the number already removed, overall access to mana the opponent has, what stage of the game you're in. In this instance, it can be more important to take a specific effect rather than a card at a specific CMC, as not having an effect available is more of a speed bump than just time walking them. Leaving Is It Storm with a bunch of rituals and no gifts ungiven, Tron with a bunch of payoffs but no sylvan scrying, Amulet Titan with a bunch of bounce lands and an amulet but no primeval titan. If in doubt, remember, Thoughtseize is used to put a wrench in the works, not to tune your own engine. It doesn't give resources, it takes them. The point is to enable your deck by disabling the opponent's overall strategy. By investigating what to take with Thoughtseize, we've already learned a lot about when to play it. There's more to learn here though, so let's continue. In understanding when to play Thoughtseize, it's also important to consider the format that you're playing it in. In modern, you're incentivized to fire it off straight away. Decks are optimized to the point that not having a play on early turns can have a huge effect on the game. If we decide to not turn one Thoughtseize, our opponent might get to play their Noble Hierarch or Goblin Guide that their hand was leaning on. We could have otherwise taken this and slowed their opening. When playing Legacy and playing cards like Duress and Cabal Therapy, it's often correct to hold the hand disruption until later in the game. This is because it's not worth getting rid of a force of will early game. What you're concerned about is being able to combo off, and you'll need to get to the mid game to do this. Removing the force of will the turn before or the turn that you want to go off is much more valuable than firing it off on the first turn in a lot of matchups. This brings us nicely onto the next point. Should I cast Thought Seize late? Most decks are in top deck mode later in the game, either because they play everything out naturally, like 
burn, or just that they want to keep things rolling so as not to lose tempo. As Thought seizes a sorcery, you'll find that catching a lone card in the opponent's hand later in the game that isn't a land will happen a lot less frequently. If the opponent is on a burn deck, casting a late game Thought Seize is incredibly risky. Burn opponents have no incentive to sandbag spells and will be able to cast them in response to the Thought Seize. Remember, Thought Seize does cost two life. That two life is a harder toll to pay the longer a game goes. The matchup where holding on to Thought Seize later in the game is more relevant is the control matchup. Control players are often sculpting a hand for the late game in order to plan ahead for what you might play. The best way to play a Thought Seize in this scenario is in a 1 2 punch. Rather than making one for one plays, hold a Thought Seize until you have a threat you'd like to resolve. Casting Thought Seize first can check if the coast is clear. In both scenarios, if the opponent uses their interaction on your Thought Seize, you still gain information, and they still lose a resource even if the spell doesn't resolve. When learning to play a card like Thought Seize, there are some common mistakes that players make. Let's look at a few now. Mistake 1 only taking the most powerful card instead of poking a hole in their strategy. Given our opponent's hand is Heritage Druid, Dwynin's Elite, Court of Calling, and another Court of Calling. In this scenario, taking Cord because it's powerful is incorrect. Not only because they have another copy, but because taking the Dwynin's Elite reduces the effectiveness of any Cord they later play. It's also stopping them committing something to the board right now. When opponents have two of something, you're only effectively delaying the backup or second copy of it if you take one. The thought process should instead be, what's the step they need to take to make that card good? Or what's the enabler for that card to be good? Mistake two. In this example, an opponent reveals two Tarmogoyf in their hand. If you have a Terminate in your hand for the second Tarmogoyf, then sure, taking the Tarmogoyf is correct. If you don't have an answer to the second Tarmogoyf, then you'll need to consider how the game plays out. Which other card in their hand can stop you from being able to play through the two Tarmogoyfs? If you have a Death's Shadow in your hand that can blank those Tarmogoyfs in a turn or two, then taking the Abrupt Decay is the answer. Those cards will be able to remove your Death's Shadow. Mistake 3. Earlier, we discussed how taking an early drop is often more correct than taking the bomb card they need for later turns. In some matchups, taking out an early Noble Hierarch or even Birds of Paradise is correct. Because if the opponent can't cast their more expensive spells as quickly, you might have a good chance at winning the game. Whether this is correct hedges on whether a matchup is considered fast or slow. In a fast matchup, we're correct to take the Mana Dork. But in a slower, grindier matchup, like versus Bant Spirits, them having a Birds of Paradise or Noble Hierarch isn't as good when the game is longer. You'd rather hit the Collected Company or other late game cards, as those are the cards that will win the matchup for the opponent. From time to time, you'll encounter niche plays with Thought Seas. Some of these are cute interactions, like when playing with or against reanimator decks. Using Thought Seas as a discard outlet if you don't have access to, say, Entomb when playing reanimator or dredge strategies yourself. There's one play with Thought Seize that is more niche than you'd think, and that's scooping in response to a Thought Seize being cast. In most cases, you are generally overestimating how much information you're concealing. If you are certain that the Thought Seize would stop you winning this match, then maybe it's correct to go to the next game with that information you've concealed. A lot of the time, though, it can be worth playing some of the match to gain information information about an opponent's deck, which is often more valuable to the average player than choosing to conceal information. You could always scoop if you don't want the opponent to know how bad you are at keeping opening hands, though. <laughs> Thought Seize isn't the only hand disruption spell used in this way, and you'll often see decks running multiple if it's a core part of their strategy. So what makes some of the other spells different? Inquisition of Kozilek doesn't cost you any life but it does only hit spells that are three mana or less. This is a spell you fire off much more aggressively and earlier. 
because late game it can't take a cryptic command, Force of Will or Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. When you run Inquisition alongside Thought Seize, it's better to sequence the Inquisition first. There's one more main piece of disruption to cover here, and that's Cabal Therapy. Cabal Therapy is very powerful, as it can take every copy of a card in their hand. The upsides are huge. If you know you're against Storm or can take a guess, you can potentially take two Lion's Eye Diamonds or Force of Wills. To balance this, though, it's hard to play. You won't see their hand until you've named a card, so the number of matchups it's viable to play this card early is quite low. To give you some idea of how hard it can be to figure out a matchup based on a turn one play in Legacy, here's a play. An opponent plays a Volcanic Island and then casts a Ponder. This could be any number of decks. Is it Delver? Well, maybe, but maybe not, because it could be Teamer Delver, or Grixis Delver, Sneak and Show, or Storm. As you can see, it's basically impossible to really call it either way. Looking at these other options is useful when considering building your own decks. But more than that, they give us more reasons to respect the turn one Thoughtseize, especially when we look at how weak Duress is compared to Thoughtseize. The astute amongst you will have no doubt pointed out that there's also Surgical Extraction and Unmoored Ego. but. Cards like that are less about the right now of an immediate resource which can be redrawn into, but more about them never having the resource at all. One of the strongest heuristics to measure when evaluating your progression as a player is knowing exactly what your opponent is up to, instead of just playing blindly or reactively. Thoughtseize helps you learn this approach, and can also plug gaps in experience by giving you that extra knowledge. It doesn't matter about the matchup or what the cards are. You're learning the flow of the game and how to ride that flow. Much like in martial arts, it's all about being in the flow state, of being able to read and anticipate the flow of the match, rather than simply knowing the individual moves, and in this case, cards and overthinking your application of them. Thanks for watching another session of Talarian Tutor. Today's was the first in a new series, and I'm really excited to bring it to you. Today we covered Thought Seize and Hand Disruption. We learned what hand disruption is, what cards to take, when to take them, and common mistakes. This is Talarian Community College. I'm the professor. Our professional consultant is my own tutor, Emma Handy. Kristen Gregory is our script supervisor. Patrick Lickman, our editor. And remember, it's not about winning individual games of magic. It's about getting better, win or lose.